Uh, good evening, a very warm welcome to the British Library this evening. My name is John, I look after the events programme here at the British Library. And it's our absolute pleasure to welcome back to the library Carlo Rovelli. And tonight he'll be in conversation with Tom Whipple, who's a science editor at The Times. So thank you very much for being here. And thanks to those who are watching online and those of you in the future sometime who are watching the film of this event. Nice to see you too. So tonight, obviously, we're going to be talking about Carlo's newly published uh, Anna Maxander and the Nature of Science, which I believe is not new to Carlo, but it's new to uh, in new in English. So it's an exciting, exciting journey of discovery for this incredible thinker, uh, which was new to me, and I'm sure you'll be finding out things probably that you didn't know this evening as well. Here at the library, we have everything under the sun from all generations, all eras, all cu cultures and um, and, and uh, languages. We've just finished an exhibition on Alexander the Great, which maybe some of you have seen, but Alexander was way after Anna Alexander. He was, he was 300 years or more later, so, um, you know, positively a, a, an heir to the great thinking that went before. So tonight, yes, obviously we're with, we're with Tom Whipple. Unfortunately, Sarah Perry had to pull out a few days ago through ill health, but she was very disappointed not to be here, and I believe she's watching online too, so kind of in the room. The event will take the normal format. It'll be about an hour of conversation. Then there'll be a chance to ask your questions. Uh, those of you who are watching online can post a question in the form below the video, and we'll get to some of those, and we'll read some of those out later. And then after that, we have a number of Carlo's books, including the new one, Anna Alexander, uh, which will be on sale down by the shop, and Carlo will be stopping to sign copies. That is it from me. Please enjoy the event, and over to Tom and Carlo. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much for coming, and apologies for not being Sarah Perry. Um, uh, it's, it's lovely to see you all here. So Carlo Rovelli is an Italian theoretical physicist. Um, he is most famous, I think, amongst physicists for his uh, work on quantum loop gravity, which is about uh, uniting, uh, finding a way, this, this sort of great holy grail way of uniting um, general relativity with a standard model of particle physics. Um, it's not normally a topic we get so many people for. We're waiting for the blackboard so uh, we can get going on equations. Um, no, it's, it's, it, it's 7 p.m. and it's a Tuesday and we're not here to talk about quantum loop gravity. We are here to talk about Anaximander um, and uh, the book that uh, Carlo has written about him. Um, Carlo is far more famous amongst non-physicists uh, for his science writing, in particular in the UK, his book Seven Brief Lessons on Phys Physics, which was that uh, unusual, I think probably hitherto unseen publishing phenomenon, a stocking filler about theoretical physics, uh, which did extremely well in, uh, I think, 2015. Um, but before he wrote that book, in Italian, he wrote his book about Anaximander, um, who I think is probably one of the greatest philosophers that most of us, I mean, I'm talking to myself, hadn't really ever heard of. Um, and now it's been translated, and he's here to tell us in his own words about his, why well, I think you're a little bit in love with Anaximander, or what you were when you built, wrote it. it was. A man who you wrote in his excellent book, uh, changes the very grammar of our understanding of the universe. Um, before I give this talk, uh, the last book talk I chaired, I forgot to say at the end, books are available to buy at the back, um, <laughs> and that's probably my only job here. So I will say it at the beginning, and I will say it at the end as well. Books are available <laughs> to buy at the back. Please do buy one. Um, but let's get straight on to it. Um, who is Anaximander? <laughs> well, first of all, thank you very much, Tom, for doing that. <laughs> um, very grateful. Um, and thank you all of you for, for being here. It's a, it's a pleasure. Uh, and British Library is a place, it's really a place for a person like me want to be. Who is Anaximander? Uh, for me, it was a surprise. I'm, so, I'm sure it's, uh, it's, uh, it's little known or not known at all by the majority of people. For me, it was a surprise, it was a big surprise. Uh, I stumbled upon him by chance because I was teaching, at some point I decided to teach a class at university, uh, a course on the history of ancient science. And so I, I got, I was, I've always been interested in the history of science. So I was teaching a class and I was um, learning about uh, 
an ancient astronomy and uh, Ptolemy, Hipparchus, uh, how do we figure out that how big is the Earth and all these kind of things. And, and then I was asking the people who did that, where did they get their ideas? And so in studying, I was going backward and backward and backward. And somebody realized that, <clears throat> that all the pointers in antiquity toward the source of practically all the ideas out of which um, ancient science came out were pointing toward this guy, an, an Aximander. I got curious. And I knew about Aximander because I'd studied in high school in Italy. We, in Italy, we follow class the history of philosophy. Everybody does a little bit of history of philosophy. In the beginning, there's always a first page of the book in which says history. Um, so philosophy is born in Greece, which is questionable, but <laughs> Philosophy was born in Greece, and in fact, it was born through three guys. One is Thales, one is an Aximander, one is an Aximenes. And Thales talked that everything is made of water, and an Aximander talked that everything is made by Aperon, which nobody knows what, what it is. In Italian, Aperon so sounds like a cocktail, Aperon. <laughs> and the third one is an Aximenes um, talked that everything is made of air. Turn off the page, next one, Socrates, or whatever. It made no sense whatsoever, right? This is just empty. I mean, how can philosophy come out from three people saying three silly things? So that's the only thing I knew. But then I discovered that all these ideas about naturalistic understanding about the world, about the cosmos, about how things happen, were pointing to him. So I got curious and more curious, and I started to read everything that I could find about this guy, which is not much because it's not a and uh, uh, there are a few books about him. Uh, there are some scholars who studied him and tried to reconstruct what was in his book through the, um, the, 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 the ancient authors referring to him. And I made a list of what presumably was in his book according to this reconstruction. And then it was, I was deeply struck. I said, wait a moment. This is a major jump in human thinking. There is a breaking here. Rupture, like the French uh, say. There is something, a, way of, a human way of thinking that we see up to that point and a totally different one from that point. And then this was my love for Anaximander that exploded. That's like, <laughs> there's, there's a chapter. And that was 600 years later, was it? Yeah, that's it's, it's, uh, somebody 600 years later imagining how Anaximander could have Which been. is still a long time ago. So talk, talk us through, before we get on to the yeah. list of things that that we believe and Aximander believed and that he thought about, set the scene. So where is he? When is he? What was his, insofar as we can say anything, what was his life like? What was the society like that he was born into? And what sort of things did it believe and do? Yeah, so this is a sixth century before our era. So this means a uh, um, century and a half of two before classic. Greece, before almost everybody you can think about uh, the Greek civilization. I would say everybody except Homer and uh, Hesiodus. How is pronounced in English? Hesiodus? Hesiod. Hesiod. There are a couple of authors that are before him who tell stories about, um, about the gods or about Troy and, 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 and Ulysses. Um, it's before Athens became powerful, be before Sparta became powerful. He lived in Miletus, who is a, is a city on the coast of uh, uh, what's today Greece, Asia Minor. Minor. So this is, this is modern day Turkey, but at the time it was Greece civilization wise. At the time it was, yeah, it, the, the, the city of Miletus is actually very ancient, goes back to the, to, to the millennium earlier, but it was colonized by the, it was destroyed various times by various people. It was colonized by the Greek a few centuries before, maybe two or three centuries before. So it was a mostly Greek population, which got in, mixed with local population. Greeks had, uh, in the couple of centuries before, had expanded uh, in what is southern Italy today, southern France, the Black Sea, so there were all these col Greek colonies uh, everywhere. But Miletus was particularly successful as a city um, because uh, it, it had its own colonies and it was a sort of a center of a little empire. Uh, he, had, he had maybe 20 or 30 colonies, 
all over the Mediterranean, was trading with all of this, was trading with Egypt, trading with Mesopotamia, and was rich. It was probably perhaps the richest uh, city in this strange constellation which was Greek, the, the Greek civilization, which never got united in a, in, in, in a kingdom or, 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 or a state, it was, it was fractured, uh, um, was well, doing well, um, commercial, and had gone through this um, typical um, process of political um, rapid evolution that many Greek cities and also Carthaginus or Rome a few centuries later went through, uh, namely kings b being taken down by the aristocracy and then democracy and then political parties and then a, a complex political rediscussion of how to, uh, to arrange the social life of, of, of the city, which happened in many, in many parts of Greece, which had not happened in the old uh, kingdoms and empires uh, which existed since millennia, right? Egypt was 3,000 years older at the time. Or the, in, the, in the Mesopotamia uh, area, there was Babylonia, there were... Uh, um, it's, life of the next one is shortly after the fall of, the, um, of Nineveh and the Assyrian Empire, because the Persian were already coming down and so on. Um, after the life of Anaximander, the Persian Empire would conquer completely the, the, the Mesopotamia. It would destroy Miletus, basically kill all the inhabitants of Miletus or take them slaves. Um, so I think Miletus was a, I can imagine a city uh, with a lot of commerce, um, a lot of ideas coming from all over because we're in contact with, with all, all over, very alive and characteristically, and maybe that's important for understanding why what happened happened, um, in touch with the knowledge, with ancient knowledge, mathematics, astronomy, writing, and everything uh, of the ancient civilization, Egypt, Babylonia, but without, outside from the rigid power structures of the empire. Himself, we know very little on Aximander. We know that he was uh, most likely an important person, part of the aristocracy there. Um, some order says that he was a head of a colony at some point. He probably uh, traveled a lot. Maybe he went to Babylonia, maybe he went to Egypt. We don't know. Uh, because all, all, a lot of people talk about him in ancient, but these are people who talk about him centuries later. So it's stories of stories stories uh, so this is a report of a trip of him in Sparta for instance where he's said to build a, uh, a sundial uh, with which Sparta was uh, keeping time and also a report of him predicting a earthquake which doesn't make any sense it's probably I mean unless there was some knowledge that we don't know but I consider absolutely in unlikely that this is the case um, so that's sort of the did he have a job? I mean, was, was this the sort of place where they paid people to think and be philosophers? Or was he, you know, do we get the idea he was independently wealthy? Or, which presumably tells you something about the state itself. The Greek cities uh, had a structure with slaves, um, with uh, peasants, with uh, a class of people working in the city, like artisans and things like that, and with an upper class which was mostly um, uh, running the political business, taking arms when needed, and also running all the commerce. And uh, um, so it was a strati stratified society. He clearly was part of the upper strat strat of society. Um, he's said to run a colony, which means he had a political role at some point, uh, somewhere. Um, People talk about the school of Miletus. Thales was older than him. Now, I spent some time, I'm not a historian, I spent some time reading everything I could, try to figure out what it means in school at that point. Um, the aristocracy, I mean, the aristocracy, a big chunk of the society knew how to read and write and was probably very 
the first moment in, for humankind where you had a big chunk of a society that knew how to read and write. Because writings was much older, of course. Writing goes back two or three millennia before. But up to that point was mostly in the hands of uh, specialized uh, people, scribes, that would work for the power uh, and with the, the guy who knew how to write. So, so the ruler would have somebody working for them in writing. Or people in commerce that would use writing as a, as a tool for administration and things. So writing as a basic education of a large part of the uh, population just happened a few decades ago, I mean less than 500 years ago, since then. Which means that somebody should have taught the kids how to read and write. So certainly there were tutors, all sorts of schools. Now we know very well how this worked a century later or two centuries later in Athens. We know about the schools of Aristotle. We don't know what was in Miletus. Um, Presumably there was a school where a place where you go and learn and the kids of the, of the upper class uh, get an education and like it was um, the academy or the lycée in, in, in Athens uh, in the well-known period. I mean, this is funny because there are periods of history in which we have all sorts of information about, right? We know, we know what happened in Athens every day um, in the fifth century, day by after day, we have, we have, or in Rome at the time of Caesar, uh, we can say where these people were every day for, for, and then there are long periods in which we don't know anything. Um, so we know very little about that period, but uh, the way I imagine is that um, there was a place where people could discuss um, what we would call today cultural issues, questions about everything, because the book that he wrote, it's a sort of summa about everything, how nature works, how history works, how biology works, how the sky works, and how the history of the, u of the universe went. So this, this is, was so discussed this, somehow. This is, so I think we've teased long enough. So tell us wh why we're here. So we've got the background. Why, why do we care about Anaximander? What, what was this book and what, was his, what were his theories? Yes, so let's get to the core of the matter now. What was in this book? Um, a lot. That's the first point. Um, and if I had to summarize and almost, was, um, some astonishing ideas to which I want to come in a moment. But before that, um, I just said that presumably the book was a, an account of, a, of knowledge about the world. And that was not new at all, because we have many books of antiquity which are accounts of the knowledge about the world. And the way they usually work is as follows. Uh, it all started with a big god, blah, blah, blah who fought with his other big god, blah, 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 and made love with other goddess, blah, 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 and what came out is the earth, and then they fought, and then they killed their father, and then they, I mean, that's the story, okay? And then out of that, our king uh, come out, and we must be reverent to the king, and that's it, okay? And uh, why the rain comes down? Because Jupiter, or Zeus, uh, sends the rain. Why the wind blows? Because uh, uh, the king, the, 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 the god of the, uh, uh, of the wind blows. Why there is a storm, and what to do about the storm on the sea, where there is Poseidon, and we have that. So in other words, <clears throat> up to that point, everything we have, and we have a lot, um, in writing about the world, uh, it's a story about how the gods um, determine the fact of nature. And then we have this book, which first of all, unlikely everything else on the topic, is not written in poetry, but is written in prose. So Anaximander is literally the, 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 the guy who invented the prose, which Molière made fun about that, but it, he, he invented the writing in prose. And uh, the entire book, it's an account of the fact of the world where the gods play no role at all, and all phenomena are, there's an attempt to explain all phenomena in terms of natural phenomena. For instance, this is one of my preferred one, comes straight from there, where does the water, where does the rain come from? Where does the water of the rain come from? Well, it comes from uh, the evaporation of the water on the ground, which goes up, evaporate, and then 
condensate again, comes down. Okay, who understood that? Anaximander. It's in his book. And, uh, and that's what we learned at primary school of the cycle of the water, and now we know where the rain comes from. But they don't tell us that it was an Aximanda that found it. Um, so he has naturalistic explanation about, um, about the fact of the world. And a lot of this, some are completely wrong, as one can imagine, <clears throat> but a lot of remarkably good. And a lot of attempts of throw ideas of how could the world works, uh, they're surprising. Um, for instance, he talks about um, change of climate through the time and the fact that uh, uh, living species change according to the climate. So they probably change through times. He asks where humankind could come from. And uh, he says it could not be just by itself because babies are not self-sufficient. So it's impossible to think that just a baby came out. So it should be some other species that predated the humans. And then he goes through some argument and says that um, presumably life came from water, from the ocean, and then evolved when, when the earth dried up enough so that it could work up. Astonishing to read the things. He, has a, he does a story of the beginning of the universe, which is, you know, obviously nothing to do with like modern science cosmology, but it looks like modern science cosmology. And at the beginning there was a big explosion and there's a sort of crust of fire that break up in pieces. Uh, totally another language than the story of the gods. So it's a moment in which him or his school or his culture, I don't know exactly how it happened, um, came out with the idea of thinking about nature in terms which is open up the naturalistic questions that slowly evolved into what call a scientific approach to the world. And then there's a main then, idea. So you've missed off and the And then there's one. a main idea. <laughs> the main idea is what um, Popper called the most portentous ideas that humankind ever had, which is what made me fall in love with him, which is the following. Um, Earth floats into nothing sort of linger in the, over the abyss without falling. Um, Earth is not the ground which is below the sky, but it's like a big stone that floats with the sky all around. And uh, how the hell somebody could guess that and understand that or get reasonably to think that, I find it's magic. And um, at the beginning you said, my work is quantum gravity, this has nothing to do with quantum gravity. It's not true. This has to do with quantum gravity because to do quantum gravity means try to think the world differently. Mm -hmm. To do the kind of step, think about space differently because of quantum mechanics, well, time different because of quantum mechanics. So uh, change the way we think about the world in the kind of ways that Einstein did or um, Faraday Newton did, or Copernicus did, um, to understand the world better, more in large, we have to change something deep about our world. So and he, he was uh, in a world where it was obvious that up is there and down is exactly. there, and hence something has to hold up the world. Exactly. But so uh, that was what people thought at his time. But not just uh, in, in, in Miletus, that is what people were thinking in, in Egypt, in Babylonia, that was what people think in China, in India, in Africa, in, 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 in the ancient American, uh, the Maya were thinking that. Uh, in fact, everybody else through the planet conceived the cosmos as the earth down and, and, and the, uh, the sky up, okay? And then this guy comes and says, no, 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 you, you all got it wrong. And can you imagine, I mean, this is <clears throat> in the square of Miletus, one, at some moment, I don't know how old was he when he said that, he goes to the square and, and talks to his fellow citizens, you know what, um, your father, your grandfather, everybody through the, through the world thought, think this way, but you're wrong, you're wrong, I got it right. The earth is just a stone and the sky continues all around it, under our feet. How much courage does it take? To do that, <clears throat> not 
at the end of a long process of science, but at the beginning, the first time that this happened. And how, did, how could he do that? Okay. I go, this is how I opened the book, in fact, this, by, by, by telling this. Um, but then one thing I tried to do to the book is try to reconstruct what could have been the process for him to get to that. That's my own reconstruction, of course, we, we don't know. Uh, but if you think um, from now, I think the interesting story, it goes back and forth in the following way. Um, how do we know that there's nothing below us? On the one hand, come on, it's pretty obvious because uh, we see the, the sky turning around us. You just go out in a summer day, you can even do it in, the, in, in England. You don't need to be in Greece or in Turkey. Uh, sometimes you do see the sky and sometimes it's warm. Okay? And, uh, and, uh, and, uh, and you see the star going around, right? And if you look north, you see the sky during the night moving and the sun goes down, and then the sun reappears the other side. And the moon goes down, and then reappears the other side. So how do, how do they go through? If there's Earth all the way down, there's, there's a problem. Unless there are always new stars, a new sun, every, time, every day is a new sun or a new moon. Um, so it's very tempting to think it's the same sun, it's the same stars, and they just pass through. But if they have to pass through, there should be nothing. It should be open. So if this open, it means that there is nothing uh, below the Earth. So it's very simple. Okay. But this is the point. If it is very simple, why nobody in China got it? They're not stupid, the Chinese, right? Why nobody in America got it? Why nobody in Egypt got it? They, they, there's a huge amount of civilization that developed. Humans are intelligent, they do things, and nobody got it. Why? Because of what you said at the beginning. At some point you said, well, up and up, down is down, and the heavy things fall down. So if, the earth, if there was nothing under the earth, well, the earth would fall. So I can imagine this conversation through centuries and centuries of civilizations happening so many times. You know, two smart people looking at the sun going down and one saying, oh, the morning come up, how, how does it go through? And one of the two saying, well, must be nothing, and maybe it's, uh, it's the other one saying, no, 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 because it would fall. Oh, yeah, it would fall. It's impossible. <laughs> okay. And then come an examiner and say, wait a minute. Why should it fall? Maybe we are wrong in extrapolating the fact that objects fall to the Earth itself. Maybe we are taking something, it's our habit of thinking, and making it universal when it's not universal. Okay. Maybe we are wrong in take our experience and think that everything is like our experience. So maybe if we were the other side of the Earth, things will fall up. If we're this side of the Earth, things will fall this way. Okay, things will fall this way. And he was smart enough to convince people around him. In fact, it's, it's remarkable because he, he got this idea, he convinced the people around him, he convinced the, 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 the thinkers that follow him, uh, Anaxagoras, uh, Empedocles, uh, Socrates, Plato. Plato writes, um, I'm not sure, but I think it's reasonable that the Earth is just a, a sphere, a stone, and, 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 and things fall. So he convinced all the, all the uh, cultured people in Greece, and then um, Alexander the Great conquered all the area going from India, and so the cultured people convinced everybody, and so the Indians got to know about that from the Greek. And the Chinese got convinced only when centuries later the Europeans went there. The Chinese were still thinking that the sky is just above the Earth um, a millennia later. And in the Americas, uh, people changed their mind only when they got so... So it, for the rest of the planet, it took somebody to go and tell the story before coming out from the wrong idea that up and down are universal. But now to to be able to get out of the idea that up and down are the way they obviously are, it took the courage of somebody who, you know, has the courage to say what we all have been think thinking since generations is wrong. And I have an idea that could be better. Einstein did that, Newton did that, Copernicus did that. I mean, it's, 
But now it's easier because somebody else has, uh, has done it. I'm paid for, you know, Carlo, you should get money and salary, but you should try to do something like that. Me and my colleagues and, and everybody else, because no, it's possible. But he not only did this, it's the first cosmological evolution, but he realized that it's possible to do that. He realized it's possible to do he or his school or his, I don't know how it happened. So I think that uh, um, it, this is a major step in the development of human thinking because the first cosmological evolution changed the image of the cosmos uh, and because even more it's the opening of the realization that by changing the image of the cosmos you can learn more. You can jump out of your story and get another story that works better. So was this, was this the, I mean, you, you talked about your Italian school books. Was this the start of science? Was this the first page? And if so, what is science? Um, my book, it's mostly about this question. So somehow Anaximander is, uh, it prompted me to ask exactly this question. And uh, um, the first time it was published uh, uh, by an obscure publisher in, in the US who sold 25 copies. Um, the title was a first scientist. And uh, some reviewer who actually did not read the book uh, comment, oh, come on, this is stupid. Why should you say that this is the first scientist? He didn't have mathematics. He didn't. Uh, uh, uh. Um, what am I trying to say? Uh, the, the notion of first scientist is, is obviously uh, extremely vague because science is not a yes or no thing. What we call modern science is a complex uh, um, sort of institution and body of knowledge and set of technologies and tools uh, which develop very slowly. Uh, through the centuries, and a lot of things which we call today science were obviously not in, in an axiomat. There's no mathematics, there's no measurement, there's no testing the theories, uh, there's no experimentation, um, and, and the list could be long. But, um, but to know what exactly is the core of doing science is not easy and is not obvious, uh, and through the centuries, not only our idea of how the work the world works changes, but also our idea of what is this to do science changes. Um, Newton had a different idea than Maxwell, and Maxwell had a different idea than Einstein about what it is to do science. And the philosopher kept discussing that, and, and, uh, and I think we, we understand better and better, uh, like we understand the world better and better, we also understand better and better what is it that we're doing um, in doing science. Even doing science changes, isn't it? not only with... And I think that um, the philosophy of science of the 19th century that says uh, science is discovering the truth about the world. It's, you know, th this is true and we've got it. This is true and we've got a list of certainty. It just has not, that picture of science has not held um, even the, develop, the historical development of science itself because there's a sense that Newton is wrong, right? It's all the his greatness, um, Mercury doesn't follow the Newton equation. So Newton equations are wrong, factually wrong. So it should be more, more subtle than uh, this science. So uh, there was a retreat, us with, uh, with, especially with relativity, quantum mechanics, uh, trying to say, well, science is nothing else than writing equation and making predictions, uh, verifying theory, falsifying theory. Um, I think that this misses something core in the scientific enterprise. So for me, reflecting about what Anaximander did uh, is also reflecting on what is it to under better understand the world. Um, there's no doubt that, my opinion, that Anaximander understood something more about the world and Copernicus understood something more about the world. And, uh, and, 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 so, did, uh, and so did Newton and, and, and Maxwell, etc., or Darwin. Um, what did these people do? I think that essentially the core, the, uh, the strength, is they did what Anaximander did, namely found a, a different manner of thinking about reality which works better. And to do that, you have to take things that you give for granted uh, and throw them out of the, your thinking. So is up and down a universal? No, it's not. And now you understand better. 
And you know, three millennia later, Einstein said, is simultaneity universal? No, just throw that away and you understand the world better. It's exactly the same step, okay? Um, Newton gave us a fantastic picture about the world in which the world is a, is a uniform space with little um, stones that pull and push each other with forces. And then comes Faraday and Maxwell saying, no, no, forget about that. Think about fields, electric fields, magnetic fields, completely different picture, it works better. And every time we have a stronger, richer conceptual framework, we change perspective about reality and we get a better one. And we don't need to think it's definitive. In fact, after changing so many times, we presumably think we're not at the end of this story, obviously. Mm -hmm. um, but if that, a core aspect of science, uh, uh, that goes back to that revolution that happened in Miletus 26th century ago. And then, of course, mathematics was a huge improvement, a tool. Experimentation was a huge improvement, a tool. Verification is a huge improvement, a tool. Instrument, uh, microscope, telescope. Uh, again, these are tools that added to this main activity, which is uh, changing the grammar with when we understand the world. Up and down means different thing after and after. Before and you, you make the case, that, so you, you talk in the book that Anaximander himself um, rejected the teachings of his master while respecting the yeah. teachings of his master. And yeah. that's, that, that's how you view no Newton, presumably. Yeah. And, but yeah. you don't think this, and you use the comparison to the Chinese court, you don't consider this to be just an inevitable part of being human. You could imagine a swerve not. of history where I think, I think it's you not. wouldn't have that. Yeah, because one well, thing I write in the book is that if you, if, if you look at ancient times, it's full of school of thought which are in a fight against one another, or, or tribes fight and, and, and civilization fighting one another. And uh, I write in the book, if you think of the Bible, the Bible, the way it talks about the knowledge of Babylonia, it's very, very critical. It's, uh, it's demons. Um, so critics is there, it's true antiquity. Us is there following a master. The, the, all civilization had masters and followers. Jesus said Paul, I mean, is, uh, um, uh, Confucius, is Mencius, or, uh, uh, or whatever. Or Pythagoras had its, uh, its, its, its followers. Um, Anaximander had a master, which is always um, called his master in antiquity, which is Thales. Thales was considered one of the great uh, um, wise people of ancient Greece. Uh, and it's no doubt that Anaximander follows Thales, because in Thales there is already this uh, uh, attempt to understand everything in terms of natural phenomena. A lot of the ideas that I'm saying are from Anaximander, are actually from Thales. Um, but very open and very critically, there are ideas which are different between the two. And the ancients say, Thales thought that, but Anaximander disagreed. And, uh, and in fact, there's a, there a passage in um, Ciceron, Ciceron, how do you say, in, uh, the, 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 the Roman? Cicero. Cicero, yeah. Uh, in which he says, uh, um, Thales think that the complexity of all the things, um, it's a single substance, which is water, and strangely, Anaximander, that is his companion and, and, and friend, disagrees. I mean, how is it possible? They're friend, how could they disagree? Right? It's his master. How can you disagree with his master? Okay? So, what is it? Six century later, still strange that you don't agree with your master. And that's the methodological turning of the page, right? So, between following the master and taking everything down and trying something else, there's the third way. And the third way is to build on the knowledge that you receive, but be able to challenge it nevertheless and change something. And suddenly, this is what opened the key of the development. This is why it's the beginning of philosophy, the beginning of science. 
because Anaximenes does the same with him, and Anaxagoras does the same with them, and, uh, and then Socrates and criticizes them, and then Plato, this follow of Plato follows, doesn't criticize Socrates, but changes and pretends Socrates to say something certain, and, say, and, and Aristotle criticizes Plato, and then start this thing in which you build on the quiet knowledge, being aware that something can be changed there. Uh, and that's how we got all the knowledge that we, we have. The building of the past, uh, but being ready to... to, to so is, is this sort of Newton standing on the shoulders of giants? That's kind exactly. Of thing? And New, is Newton. he the first giant? Is he, or is Thales? Sorry? Is, is he the first giant on which everyone else made this tottering inverted pyramid of... No, because I think that uh, the, what, what the, the people of... The, the school of Miletus did obviously even if it's hard for us to recognize uh, the, 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 the connections, uh, had big influence from the knowledge in Babylonia, from the knowledge in Egypt. Uh, these are people who traveled and, and, uh, and, and learned things. Uh, one thing that the, the ancient author attributed to uh, Thales and um, or Anaximander is invention of a gnomon. The gnomon is the sundial, essentially. This, this way of measuring this, this, the sun by, by a stick, and you can do a lot of astronomy, basic astronomy with that, uh, which actually existed before in, uh, in, in Egypt and in Babylonia. Um, the long attention to the movement of the stars, which clearly nourish all that. Uh, so they built, they certainly built on, on, on previous knowledge. Um, I think it's, it's a long dialogue that, uh, that grows. Uh, but this so critical master-pupil relation, uh, Thales and Aximander, I think it has become the, um, the, the, the blueprint of all universities today, right? You, I'm, a, I'm a university teacher. What I really want is one of my students try the paper saying, Carlo Rovet is wrong because, because, uh, because, look, I can do better. Yeah, that's it. I got it. <laughs> and uh, do, do you sort of think that, um, so, so pulling out a bit, you talk about Cicero and what he said about Anaximander. I think it's worth explaining how we know anything about Anaximander at all, because to all intents and purposes, we, we have nothing that he wrote. We have nothing that he wrote, um, which doesn't prevent us to talk about people's ideas, right? We talk about Jesus' ideas or Buddha's idea or about uh, Alexander the Great ideas. So we don't have nothing written by them. But all, everybody wrote about them. So we have other people wrote about them. So there's a lot written in ancient texts about Anaximander. Well, there isn't a lot. There is a, a lot of reference to Anaximander. Uh, Aristotle has a very number of references. Anaximander says that, Anaximander uh, think that. Um, now, these references, you can find them all through authors of antiquity, which span many centuries. Um, some are in contra contradictory with one another. So it's far from obvious how to do, uh, how to put the puzzle together and how to reconstruct uh, from secondary sources uh, his own thinking. And that's not my job. I, because I'm not, I'm not a historian. I, my, I, I studied Greek at school when I was a kid, but I can't read Greek now, ancient Greek now at all. Um, so you need, you need to be a professional on that. And on that I relied on the people, and in the book I, 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 I refer to five or six people who spent their life trying to do this reconstruction. So basically, you have authors that go from a couple of centuries after him all the way to you know, late antiquity or Byzantium, uh, a thousand years later. And you say, well, this knew that, this knew that, this knew that. Aristotle most likely in his library had a book by Anaximander because, because it was, uh, Aristotle library had basically everything that was available about this and, and makes a lot of reference to him. Um, Theophrastus, who wrote the history of philosophy, uh, certainly had the book, except that we don't have Theophrastus either. So we have those who quote a lot Theophrastus. So, um, and we have several which quote them in different manners. So we have to see which one is more reliable. So there is certainly a large um, body of uncertainty. 
And I took what people attribute to him on which there is no certainty and sort of took away what... There are some people who just say, well, this is for sure what is there and some people who attribute much more. I chose a middle way. And what I did um, is, that's my contribution. Uh, all these people who reconstruct his thinking don't understand science because that's not their job. They're historians, they're um, historians of philosophy, they're Gre Greekist, I don't know, people studying Greek civilization, Greek language, and the classicists. Classicists, thank you. Um, and we live in this silly intellectual world in which uh, those who study the classics ignore the basis of what science is. I wouldn't be able to read the Newton equation. And those who are capable of understanding what Copernicus and Newton did have no interest in ancient history. So because of this reciprocal uh, incapacity of listening to one another, of, of, which is typical of a culture between the humanities and science, uh, there are obvious blind spot. And Anaximander is, is a prototypical example, in, in my opinion. There are others, the, the books written about that. Lucio Russo, an Italian writer who wrote a lot about that. If you, uh, modern science is rooted in many things, but one of the big roots in this is, is ancient science and astronomy and, the, and, and, and this line of ideas, Democritus, at, ancient atomists, and so on and so forth. But there are very few people who can follow understand something about the, the, the culture of that period and of science to be able to see the, the obvious uh, route and, 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 and how one come from the legacy of the other. So I found myself, it's like finding a, a jewel, right? I mean, come on, nobody has seen this, but it's obvious once you look at this. It's it seems to me it's obvious. When you look at the next mandal from the eyes of a scientist, like Popper did, I'm not the first one, yeah. jump up and say, wow. I mean, this is a genius. Have you ever fantasized about meeting him and how it would go and what you would say? Yes, of course. <laughs> I when I was writing that. the book, I was dreaming, every, you know, look at the guy. Wouldn't you like to meet the guy like that? It's, it's, a, it's a quintessential of the, you know, the smart grandfather who has thought deeply about you, okay? Uh, but my fantasies were always I would meet him and be completely disappointed because, of course, it would be completely different than my imagination. Maybe, you know, a guy full of himself who thought of having... <laughs> well, this is what I worry, because you, you've got him from these fragmentary glances, and you could imagine you could get Newton from fragmentary, fragmentary glances and not realise he's sort of a malevolent weirdo. I mean, is... What, <laughs> But you, you, I mean, what would you like? So do you think he would understand quantum loop gravity? Do you think you could take him through in an afternoon? No. <laughs> no. Obviously not. Obviously not. And uh, um, um, each, each single step in, in what we learn about the world is it, it, slow. It, it took a long time to for humankind to acquire it. And things which just seem obvious to us took a long time to digest, right? And, and then once they, they digested, they, they just become part of our common knowledge. It doesn't mean that you just say them, people. I mean, school is long and complicated, even for us, which are already in this. Uh, um, so I don't think, <laughs> um, Galileo has all this uh, talk about if, Aristotle was here and I could talk with him. Galileo constantly, clearly is in dialogue with Aristotle in his mind, okay? Aristotle would say that, Aristotle would not say that. Um, and, and Aristotle, we have this text, it was his books, it was his own writing, so it's much easier. Now, you're suggesting, could we get it all this wrong? Of course we could get it wrong. Um, but what seems to me interesting is not whether him himself, whether it was a guy, an Eximander who, we don't even know if these ideas are attributed to him, are actually him, or maybe he's, but from my perspective, I'm not an historian. I don't care about what happened. I care about the ideas, and those ideas appeared. Those ideas did, were not there before and were there after. So in a sense, 
what is of interest to me is the ideas. Whether it was him or his brother or a collection of people, uh, who cares? What's fantastic is that the humankind got this. And, 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 and the concatenation, of course, we probably get many connections wrong because we only have a fragmented view of the past. Uh, but the concatenation, the, 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 the how things influence one another, it's strongly there. And I think um, understanding how we got understood what we think we understand is important to have a perspective on our knowledge. Our knowledge is not obvious, as sometimes we think, is not given, as sometimes we think, and it's, it's just a step in a in a process. Tomorrow it will be ridiculous some of the things we think today. Like now it's ridiculous some of the things Galileo thought. And do you think that from the moment that knowledge appeared it was inevitable that we could have, this sort of golden thread could have stayed till today? You, you, I'm talking because you talk in the book, uh, you talk a lot about August, Augustine and what Augustine thought of um, Anaximander. Um, and you also talk about uh, the extent to which Anaximander came up with a world that wasn't based on theology, that wasn't based on these gods. Um, and, but then you got Augustine, a very clever man who spent a lot of time thinking about angels on pinheads. Um, could you have seen this flourishing not persisting? Yeah, I think we came very close to lose completely the that with, 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 the full, with the expansion of the Roman Empire and then the Christianization of the Roman Empire, a lot of um, that particular um, ancient scientific thing, King was lost. Um, and uh, I, I think that there is absolutely nothing um, guaranteeing a constant growth or, 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 or a line of development. I think that history is very random and uh, Whatever value system you use to, for, for evaluating it, where it's uh, intellectual understanding or moral or whatever, is just uh, going up and forth. Uh, um, things get lost, things get... And, but I do think that um, in spite of all that, there's a cumulative aspect of knowledge, um, which is underrated by modern philosophy of science. I mean, there's, I think the, the idea that uh, Science, the idea of Kuhn and Popper that science works by just, you know, theories that work and that they don't work, you throw away, you find another one, it's completely wrong. I mean, we, we, did, we do know things more um, than we did in the past. I think that's uh, undeniable. Uh, the Earth is not a, a flat thing, Earth forever, and, 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 uh, and, and sky just above the head. The, the Earth is really a floating rock in the, in, in, in the middle. So that was a step ahead. And then understanding it's round was a step ahead. Understanding that it rotates, goes around the sun was a step ahead, and so on and so forth. Um, when Darwin understood what he do, it did, it's a step ahead, that's it, we have learned it. So I think that there's a balance once again. Uh, the, the 19th century idea that, you know, there's this march toward truth is bullshit. Uh, but some contemporary idea um, that it's always relative perspective and there is no, uh, no cumulative aspect of knowledge is also not giving a good account of what is going on. Great. Well, I could keep on asking questions, but I think uh, we should probably go to you guys. Um, we've got about half an hour before you all head off to buy Carlo's book. Um, so uh, I don't actually know if there is, there is a microphone. How much did I offer you? Hmm? Five percent of us. <laughs> Honestly, I, I'm traumatized. It was um, <laughs> David Spiegelhalter, a statistician, and I sort of did this whole thing and just forgot to mention. And he was uh, staring daggers at me, and then I had to stand up as people were exiting and sort of shout and say, buy the book. So, buy the book, but I'm not shouting. Um, do we have, yes, we, we have a question at the back there. We'll start the lady in the purple uh, jumper. Hi, uh, thank you for your talk. I have a question not about the book, but about your writing process, and um, particularly about writing in Italian versus English. So I myself am Austrian and I write in German, but I find that my English writing is very different from writing in German, and I was just curious to hear about how, when you choose to write in Italian versus in English. 
Um, yes, I'm, I'm well aware of what you're talking about. Uh, um, the, the way you write in, in, in different languages, and, and uh, English or Austrian or English or Italian, it's, it, the writing is very, very different, and, and uh, it's hard to go through. But for me personally, um, it's a more complicated story because I, when I was in my late, uh, what is, 30s, uh, middle 30s, I moved to the United States. And I, I spent 10 years in the United States, so I started speaking English. Uh, I mean, I learned English as a communication language when I was young, but then there I had a full immersion. And I started uh, writing uh, technical. Uh, my, 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 my technical word is written in English. I have books of physics, which has nothing to do with books for the large public, uh, manuals about quantum gravity, treaties about quantum gravity. These are written in English. And so I had to relearn writing completely, because when I was writing in English, me being Italian, my colleagues would say, oh, come on, that doesn't make any sense. What, is, what are you doing? I mean, all these long, contorted sentences that don't go where, with all this because, hence, therefore, since, whatever. I mean, it's just, uh, so I had to relearn writing in English. And then, when I wrote an examiner for the first book that I wrote in Italian, because I was taking notes in Italian, and then um, I wrote in a version of Italian that actually sounded like English, because in the meanwhile, my writing style had evolved into, um, I think, and, and, and now I, uh, I, I find it easier to write a book for the large public in Italian, because I still control the language better. Um, but then I go through the translation, and uh, I'm, I'm very aware of all this difference of, uh, of, of, uh, of coding. Of, uh, and uh, I think it's a richness, because if you, have, if you control two languages, you have more tools. Also in English, you can do a very contorted period <laughs> with all the hands. And, uh, and sometimes it works very, very well. It's, it's fantastic. It gives you an extra tool. So I think the more language you know, the better it is. Right. Thank you. Um, we've got a lady in the green jumper here. Um, hi, I was just wondering, like, what do you think about modern, like, crossover between physics and philosophy? Because obviously, back in ancient Greece, like, a lot of these ancient physicists were also philosophers, and that's how they presented themselves. Mm -hmm. um, but now there seems to be a bit more of a separation, like at least within schooling, between the humanities and the sciences. And how do you think that's going to play out in like, the science that's coming in the future? Is it going to be more separated from its current, like inherent philosophical views? Um, yeah, it, it's a very good question. And it's, uh, the answer is, is, is a bit complicated. So. Um, when, when Anaximander started, and Thales and Anaximander started doing their stuff, whatever it was, uh, um, and then there was this sort of pre-Socratic, as we call today. We call them philosophers today. They would not call themselves philosophers, because philosophy is, uh, is a word invented later at the time of Plato, by Plato, I suppose, is invented. They would call themselves physicists. And uh, Aristotle called them physicists. Um, what were they doing? Well, they were doing their stuff, which is uh, uh, at the root of what became Western philosophy and at the root of what became Western science. And uh, the separation was uh, slow, um, and uh, it, it, it went back and forth a number of times. Probably the separation started, uh, if we believe Plato, uh, with, with Socrates. Socrates is the first one. Socrates. Um, started, uh, that's what Plato says in, in the Phaedo, or in the, in, in, in the Apology, in the Phaedo, I think. Uh, uh, it started as a, as, as a pupil in Anaxagora and says, well, what I wanted to understand the shape of the Earth and how things happen, so the question of the physicist. Uh, and then, according to Plato, Socrates changed the conversation into moral, what is beauty, this kind of different things which now we interpret more as philosophical questions. But then Aristotle corpus, part of it, 
I mean, it's, it's, it's biology. It's, it's the only name you could give it to it is biology. And I have a, I've written about Aristotle physics. It's really physics. It's a, while a part of Aristotle is what definitely we would call metaphysics. So it was still very. Um, the tools separated clearly um, through the centuries and uh, in uh, um, Middle Ages were different because the scientific project in the, around the Mediterranean was largely dead in the, in the, while the philosophical, theological process continued in other ways. The scientific project went through the Indians and came back through the Persians and the Arabs in a, in a very funny story. And in the Renaissance, <clears throat> um, you wouldn't say Galileo is a scientist or a philosopher. He's definitely both. His main dialogue is with Aristotle. Uh, he certainly engages in questions which have to do about science, but you, you wouldn't doubt calling it a scientist. I mean, he wrote the first equations, how things fall. Okay. Um, still, um, Newton was calling the, the title of, uh, of Newton's book is Philosophia Naturalis, Principe Philosophia Naturalis. So, um, while uh, tools were separating and, and, and style was separating, the, the connection was still very close and has been close uh, for long. And the separation has gone uh, more and more strong. Um, until recently, I think, the complete breaking was recently, and especially the education has separated very recently. I mean, all the major uh, scientists of the 20th century, Einstein, Niels Bohr, uh, Dirac, uh, uh, Heisenberg, uh, they all had a deep uh, education in philosophy. Einstein has made continuous reference to Hume, to Mach, to uh, Kant. Einstein read the three criticisms of Kant before being 15. So the, the, um, it's only a few generations that scientists don't study philosophy and the philosopher don't study science. And it's a disaster, in my opinion. It makes, it's not because they're the same thing, because really there is a diffi different uh, tools, different style, different project, uh, project, but it's a common effort of understanding the world, uh, which if you just look at one side and not the other, uh, it becomes much more shallow. Uh, it doesn't mean that a single person should do, know everything. I mean, a chemist can do just chemics, and, but if a chemist has no idea about physics, it just doesn't understand chemistry. Uh, and so in, I believe the physicist doesn't have an idea about the philosophical uh, problems in methodology as well as in metaphysics, if you want, um, underpinning what he does, uh, he has a very much, very shallow. Um, so I think that in the contemporary culture, <clears throat> a lot of my colleagues, physicists, who came out very strongly, you know, saying in this country in particular, uh, philosophy is stupid, is dead because now we have science. Uh, it's just, why can you be so stupid? It's just not true. And vice versa, there's a big bunch of um, the scientific world, uh, uh, perhaps a little bit less in this country, but you know, it's dominating in Germany or in Italy, which says, you know, um, science does not think, Heidegger. Okay, yeah, it does not think. I mean, you think, I mean. Um, so it's, a, I think it's a shallowing of the, of, of particular, uh, particular views that close their, close their eyes. I think it's temporary. I mean, there will always be people specialized. We cannot know everything. Uh, but culture as a whole is a, is a complicated conversation which we learn from one another and from different directions. And I think best scientists of, of the future will have, like the great scientists of the past, a, a, a philosophical understanding of the philosophical problem. And the best philosophers uh, like philosophy of the past, and Kant knew Newton. There was no understanding of Kant without Newton. Um, we'll have an understanding of contemporary science. To what one quick question then, from uh, to what extent does uh, quantum mechanics require 
or benefit from philosophy? As someone who's you know, coming from outside it, it, it's very much changing your idea of the very nature of reality and I guess has led to a lot of cod philosophy that, that, that's nonsense. A lot, the amount of nonsense around quantum is just majestic. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, if you, go to, if you really want nonsense, go to Google and say quantum. <laughs> what comes out is just horrendous. Um, but of course, quantum mechanics is a very serious stuff with very open problems. And uh, um, the, the foundational paper, uh, 1925, Heisenberg, um, on, 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 uh, on quantum mechanics, uh, out of which then Born and the other. Uh, but the paper who really uh, found it the key of the, the opening of the paper, it's almost word by word taken from Ernst Mach philosophical uh, uh, writings about um, his imperial criticism or whatever says, uh, uh, Eisenberg says, I'm going to uh, address the quantum phenomena using only observable quantities and not assuming that there are things beyond what is observable, you know, which is an anti-realistic statement which is deeply, deeply rooted into the, into the philosophic climate of, of, of uh, Germany 1920s. Uh, um, so the, the influence of philosophy in the birth of quantum mechanics was very direct, very, very direct. Um, then, of course, in, in the 20th century, there has been this anti-philosophical attitude in, 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 in physics. The qu quantum mechanics in the 30s uh, was very much debated when Einstein and Bohr debated the famously quantum mechanics, was at the level of philosophy. Um, after the war, especially when theoretical physics mostly moved from Russia and Europe to, to the US, um, there was a, an anti-philosophical attitude, uh, which was rooted in philosophy, of course. I mean, this is a funny thing. was rooted in, uh, in, in the Vienna school, uh, right, of the neo-positivism. Uh, but the, the physicists are funny because when they talk against philosophy, they're just quoting philosophers. <laughs> when, they, when they go strongly against metaphysics, they're just repeating what was said in the Vienna school by you know, up in there. Uh, it was an anti-metaphysical attitude with just one particular philosophical school. So it's just been shallow, not to. Um, nowadays, the, uh, we're out of that. The last Nobel Prize, um, which was given by three um, uh, experimenters, and th two experimenters, one th experimental theoretician, uh, if you read the motivation of the Nobel Prize, it's very interesting because uh, it, it makes very clear that uh, it, it's about quantum foundations, and entanglement, all this kind of stuff. Um, it makes very clear that it comes from a line of research that uh, basically come from John Bell, uh, who, was, who could not publish his things because his science colleagues were telling him that philosophy is not science. Okay, and out of that came quantum Foundation Quantum Computers and the last three Nobel Prize. So once again, uh, um, this is when in the 60s, philosophical questions about how to think about quantum mechanics, some people were posing them while the anti-philosophy in physics were saying, well, that's nonsense. So much nonsense that now we have quantum computing thanks to these questions. Great, uh, so we have the gentleman at the front there. Uh, maybe we'll just pass that through, and then we'll try to get through as many as possible. Thank you. Hello. Uh, my question is about uh, the uh, naturalistic approach of ancient uh, scientists. If that approach was not interrupted by other means, such as religion, church, maybe Aristotle's school, do you think that the level of science today that we have could have been different, for example, could, have, uh, could we have achieved to find the unified theory of universe or quantum gravity? <laughs> Thank you. You know, it's just, uh, yeah, I, I, I see what you're saying. On the one hand, you know, you can do history with a lot of if, and if, if this would have happened, whatever that happened, it's extremely risky business. Um, so um, quantum mechanics is something 
found that we, about the universe discovered in the 20th century after a long sequence of new tools that didn't exist in the past. So uh, it's hard to, to make a history with hypothetical and counterfactuals. So, but certainly, um, there was a collapse of the common intellectual project that was ancient science that happened. Um, it, it, there is some uh, historians that work on that. Happens in, in, in at least in two phases uh, at the end of the, uh, toward the end of antiquity. One phase is nothing to do with religion and the expansion of the Roman Empire. The expansion of the Roman Empire was brutal and uh, it, was, uh, it shut down a lot of theoretical investigations and practical investigations. So one of the things that has happened, as far as I understand, I'm not in historians, you may be closer to that, is that the expansion of the Roman Empire blocked, uh, take down a lot of the Greek civilization, clothes, school, um, a, 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 a vivid example of that is Archimedes. We have the text of Archimedes. The text of Archimedes has a level of mathematical um, depth, the complexity, that I think I'm not exaggerating. You have to wait vice trust a 19th century analysis. Uh, Archimedes essentially was doing integrals and limits, and uh, the, the mathematics of Archimedes is more advanced than the mathematics of Newton from the perspective of mathematics. Why didn't, why nothing came out of that? Well, it was very easy because Rome destroyed Syracuse, killed Archimedes, and nobody else, there was nobody else concretely um, could do that. The Romans wouldn't care about that, and they, they, I mean, it was brutal. Um, Syracuse has, I don't know if you've been there, you, you, a little up over Syracuse, because Syracuse is the city where Archimedes lived, is, uh, is Taormina. They still have the, the theater there. And in the theater, uh, at the time of Archimedes, what the theater was meant for is to do um, um, Sophocles, Euripi Euripides, and you know, um, Oedipus. So that was kind of a thing going on there. Then Romans came conquered it, and uh, it, if you go there, the, the, the people tell you that it was rearranged to do the thing that the Roman liked, which is to have uh, lions eating people and people killing one another and everything applauding. So that's the revel of, you know, jump down in civilization that happened. Um, Corinthus was destroyed, uh, Athens was half destroyed. So there is a real stop in development of, of um, theoretical investigation with the Roman Empire, which continued a little bit in Alexandria, because Alexandria continued to have the museum and the, and the people working there. Ptolemy, of course, writes in the, in the Roman Empire, so it continued for a while. But then there was a Christianization of the empire, which your wife had written about, <coughs> which... Uh, Another book I'll plug later. Yes. <laughs> so is it on sale? <laughs> yeah. Alas, no. Buy the book of his wife, it's a wonderful <laughs> book. I'm reading it. Um, which uh, was really the death of everything. So the, the, the last philosophy school closed, the, 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 the old schools that were millennium back to Plato and Aristotle closed, Alexander development was closed. And it was dramatic. I mean, the, the mathematics of, 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 um, that we find in, in, in Ptolemy um, came back to the Mediterranean through India. Okay, it's astonishing. I mean, this is the magnetic developed in the Mediterranean. The um, sine and cosine, I'm sure you all studied sine and cosine. You know why it's called sine? The, the function that does like that, right? So it's called sine because the Greek called it chord. Because if you have a round thing and your chord is a string, if you, if you tie a string, um, that function is a function of the angle, the length of the string, right? Um, Chord was translated in Hindi, uh, in Hindi, into a, um, a not Hindi, in Sanskrit, a Sanskrit word that uh, that means string, which is uh, ja, jia, something like that. I don't know if some, anybody knows Sanskrit. Then, um, when the Indian mathematics uh, was brought back to the Persian Empire, it was translated in Arabic because Arabic, meanwhile, was a 
Uh, and uh, the sound ja was taken, transliterated in Arabic, ja, but it happened to be similar to an Arabic word that means pocket, okay? And so when pocket was uh, translated in the 14th, 13th, 14th century back into Mediterranean from Arabic to Latin, it was translated sinus, <laughs> okay? Because the sinus means like a concavity like that, okay? So we call this thing sinus, which is the thing that was invented by Greek mathematics with a name which is a Latin name that comes from an Arab name, that comes from the Indian name, that comes from, from the Greek translation into Indian. And, you know, it's a beautiful story about... Uh, but the incredible thing is that from Egypt and, and, and Syracuse, where Archimedes was using this quantities, uh, it had to go to India and come back, because in the Mediterranean, we killed all the people who knew these things. <laughs> Sorry, I got lost in there. <laughs> there were, uh, so there's, uh, in fact, if you pass the um, microphone back to that lady in the stripes, jump in, we'll try to get around as many as possible. Hi, um, sorry, I just want to say you're a really big inspiration to me. Um, I read all of your books when I was 17, so um, I really respect you. Um, but I just wanted to ask, you mentioned um, the importance of drawing the connection between the humanities and the science. Um, and I was just wondering, do you think there's also a significance between the combination of the sciences and the arts? Um, um, it's, it's much or less obvious that it, it, it direct influence, um, it, it's effective for one of the others. Um, but I think that uh, uh, I mean, I come from a, from a culture, an ed educated man or woman. Um, if he doesn't know the arts, it misses something major about the, the beauty of what exists and we can do. And if he if, if doesn't know the science, it misses a major part of what we know about the world. And uh, if, if we look at the history of, uh, of hard history, it's not... Uh, difficult to see how um, common ideas develop. You, you asked about quantum mechanics. Quantum mechanics, one of the ways to think about quantum mechanics is the idea that uh, a particle by itself doesn't have a properties. It's only reference to other properties that, uh, okay? And, and this idea came out very strong in 1925-26. In Italy, which I know better, in exactly in those years, 25-26, Theodore Pirandello was writing this beautiful uh, place uh, whose main idea is that you as a human don't have an identity and you have a different one with respect to, uh, to any other one. I mean, it's all, uh, is that a, a coincidence? Is that, no, it's not a coincidence. It's a direct influence. It's not a direct influence. But is that what was happening in the civilization in Europe in the 20s? I mean, some of the abandoning the idea. Uh, the cubism is the same period, okay? Picasso and France Braque were, were making a painter with the same thing is different from different perspectives. It's a, this complexity, the, 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 the abandoning of the idea that there's a single clear perspective, you can isolate the thing itself. So there's a, there's a commonality of things going on, which doesn't mean that Picasso should have learned quantum mechanics or, or, or Pirandello should, or, or vice versa. Um, but it's a com I think it's a common story. And I think it's fine if we go to our education, we learn science, or, or, or we do theater, or we do visual arts. Um, but I, I worked as, as, as academic trying to build bridges, and to, uh, as, especially in this country, uh, I'm learning, it's, it's very early in this country in which you, you serve, it's too early. I mean, why, why at 15 somebody has to choose whether to be ignorant about Shakespeare or be ignorant about Marx? Well, that's stupid. I mean, it's, uh, you don't want to be ignorant about one of them. That means you want to learn more, have a larger basis. And then, of course, you specialize because you're going to give you a contributor. And, uh, I mean, I, I'm not an artist. Um, I, can, I can paint. I shouldn't paint uh, because I'm better with equations. But, but I think the, um, it's, the more we, we, we keep educations uh, on a larger basis, uh, it seems to me the more we, we do 
better artists and better scientists. Um, we're going to, there's quite a few questions, so I'm going to demand shorter answers. Okay, sorry. Um, if, uh, so if you can pass the microphone back there, and then I'm going to start moving to people at the back, and I'll try to get to the... Yes and no questions. Um, <laughs> not really yes or no, but... So do you think that the religious texts, especially like the current major monotheistic religions, would be inspired by Anaximander's approach to evolution, you know, from water and soil and from one organism to another? Because especially in the Islamic texts, you have some of them at least. Uh, the formation of a fertilized egg, the creation of a fertilized egg of Adam inside a soil and water and that kind of model. So what's the question exactly? Like, if I think that, no, sorry, I missed the one thing you said at the beginning. Do, do you think that there is a connection between oh. the Anaximander's you know, approach to evol evolution and the religious texts that came afterwards in his time, such as the Islamic texts and the ones in the monotheistic religions? Because they do reference the um, kind of creation of Adam, especially the Islamic texts, from a fertilized egg in soil, in water, and etc. No, I think there's a common ground from which uh, there's, a, there's a number of... Uh, the, 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 there is a richness of common histories about how all came out, uh, which are more ancient than both, uh, I think. I mean, we have, we have histories and histories. And, I mean, uh, so you see, think that it's possible that Anaximander was influenced by the, oh, yeah. same, the same things that went on to influence yeah. their, sort of their common ancestor? Yes, that's right. That's right. I, I, I try to find, I mean, there's, a, there's some hypothesis in, that in, 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 in the Bible, there, in the Deuteronomy, and there are some pieces in which it talks about the earth being suspender of the abyss. It was written exactly at the time, uh, I mean, shortly after an accident and what is. So there have been some speculations that whoever in Israel wrote that knew about, uh, about those uh, ideas. It's possible, but I think it's far-fetched. Uh, gentlemen, back. Hello, hello, good evening. I uh, was wondering if there were other big uh, new ideas or um, you know, very um, modern forms of thinking in Anaximander's work on top of like thinking that humans could have evolved from, from another species or the fact that it could be a round planet with the, su the, the, the sky around it. The other you know, unexpected ideas that then weren't found again way later on in, uh, in physics. Um, am I forgetting something? I, th I, think, I think you went through everything that he <laughs> came up with. Um, there, there are quite limited sources, aren't there? Um, yes. Now, let me just correct one thing. Uh, it's, Earth is not round in the next month. It's a funny shape. It became around just a little bit later, which is one of the reasons people get confused about that, because uh, people say, oh, Anaximander has an a, a, a Earth which is sort of a cylinder, and that's obviously wrong, and uh, shortly later somebody says the Earth is round, and that's obviously right. And, and this is silly, right, because the Earth is not a sphere. It's, it's, uh, a cylinder is just a first approximation, very bad. A sphere is a better approximation, better. But, but then the Earth is a, like a pier, and then it's not even that. And the tough thing was not to go from the cylinder to the sphere. In fact, that took less a generation. Presumably, Parmenides or Pythagoras, we don't know where exactly came from the idea of the spherical Earth. The, the hard part was to go from Earth's lying on something to the floating, to the floating. Uh, so we've got the lady there, uh, right in front of you. Yes, she's been waiting a while. Thank you. I'm trying to do two yes or no questions. <laughs> <laughs> I want to go back to humanities and science, and I'm biased. I also studied philosophy like you in the Italian books, and then I went on to study philosophy of science in Italy at university. So the first question is that when we talk about humanities and science, we keep going back then to philosophy as a particular discipline where those connections happen. And then within that, there is this particular aspect of philosophy that is interest in science and scientific thinking. My sense from back then, 30 plus years ago when I studied this, is that it was a rare thing then to have an interest in science as part of the philosophical community. 
is getting rarer and rarer. My kids in this country are not studying philosophy at school. And so the question is, are we actually losing interest in philosophy in particular as part of the humanities, or is this less traction? And if we do that, the bridges with science will be even more severe. And the second question is directly to you, is are you a rarity or are there more scientists, like leading scientists who are interested in building those bridges? And do we have the right incentives in science and academia to take an active interest in humanities the way you do? Um, uh, regarding the first, I don't know. I think countries are different from one another and the way education is, is, is organized is different. Um, uh, it, it is my impression that the UK is, se is, is particularly separated. Uh, within philosophy, philosophy of science has been growing in the last decades, I would say. Uh, but, but I'm not sure. Regarding the second question, uh, I'm not very rare. There are many others that, like me, have a similar, in fact, I would say the majority of my friends in, 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 in science have the same opinions I have, the same vision I have. Um, but definitely there is a big chunk of the scientific community uh, which uh, does not share these ideas. It seems to me that it's moving. So the, the strong uh, anti-humanities, especially anti-philosophical attitude of Stephen Weinberg or um, Stephen Hawking uh, or others, uh, I think it's less fashionable than 20 years ago. Um, so we've got about three minutes. I'm going to try to do three questions and then in a sort of quick fire. There's a gentleman there in the leather jacket, in the middle brown leather jacket. Yeah, you're looking at me. And then there's a gentleman behind as well. Um, and then we'll grab a third as well. Uh, so start with that, wherever the microphone is, I can't see. You've got the microphone Hi. there. Um, so something you say got me thinking when you said that an Aximander was able to convince people and was brave enough to do that. And that was sort of a key factor to spread his idea across countries over the years. Thinking about that in the modern times and our years ahead, do you think that it's harder for scientists to build that trust relationship with the public? And if so, what is the role of scientists and science to convince people and make people comfortable with revolutionary ideas? Um. So I have to brief, but let me break this into. Anaximander was successful, remarkably successful in his cosmological evolution. So the Greek world accepted Anaximander picture of Earth in the middle, and and and, uh, and it became almost the, the mark of the Greek cosmology. The the, the, the fact that the, Earth is, the 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 sky is all around, and it remained through the Roman time, through the medieval time around the Mediterranean. Um, it was far less successful in convincing everybody about his uh, naturalistic um, interpretation of phenomena like rain, uh, earthquakes, and uh, uh, I, I'm not sure he convinced the ancient world. His, that naturalistic approach was known, was one on the table, but was not dominating, like it became dominating only in, in the... Um, in the Renaissance. Regarding the second question, I mean, it's just a matter of time. I think we have a uh, cosmological, revol big revolution in science happen, but they take decades, centuries. They all have taken decades, centuries. You know, you open newspapers, the science have discovered that, oh, come on, it's, uh, it doesn't happen. And, uh, nobody opened the, 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 the newspaper and say, Newton has discovered the law of the universe. So, <laughs> Um, let's quickly grab the gentleman there, yeah, and then we might have to. Thank you for a fascinating talk. I, I was here. I'm here. I was very, very struck by something you said at the beginning, Carla. I keep coming back to it, and it's about the, the singular nature of this this scientific revolution that it happened one time, one place in history, as far as we know. I, th I think that's what you were yeah. saying. And I was scratching my head trying to think of something equivalent. I couldn't. I mean, um, writing or farming or tool use or uh, art, even religion, all seem to occur at different times, at different places, sometimes at the same time. And, and this, I keep coming back to that. Is, is it possible it could never have happened? Um, I think it was possible it could never have happened. I'm not sure, and this is a big thing, I'm not sure whether writing and, and, or agricultural, these things were invented one time or the other time. I think we, 
I, I think there's a debate in history, and I think these debates are dangerous because they're always culturally and politically. I mean, you know, in the West, uh, at some point we got convinced that the rest of the world was stupid and we only had, okay? Then we realized that this is silly and the, West of the, 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 the non-Western part of the world was a big, huge contribution of civilization. But then there was this anti-colonization thing for which uh, um, whatever happened in China and, 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 uh, or in India and in the Mediterranean had to be separated. It doesn't make any sense. I mean, people were going back and forth. I mean, this is a, there has been a long conversation between, everything was very connected. Uh, it seems to me, from what I read from the historians, uh, so do I really believe this story that writing was invented many times? Mm. I mean, mm. Maybe it was invented in China, and then a few centuries later it became what we call the, 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 the Egyptian. I mean, I don't, I don't know. I think we are pretty much in the dark about that. That particular discovery of the, the, the Earth, the, the shape of the Earth, we have data about that. We have a data point about that. That's really happened once. It's uh, surprising. It's very surprising, and that's what shocked me about the next amount. Um, we have reached the end. I promise one more question, and I'd love to just, if it's very quick, two minutes. I don't know if we can get a mic down here, and then I'll, uh, anyone with any other questions is just going to have to buy the book and, and guilt him socially into, into asking the questions. This is the last free question, I'm afraid. Uh, the l lady here. Do you think that in the kind of like ideas of new theories being discovered and each one being like a step closer to like a fully grand unified theory, we're gonna get close to somewhat of an objective truth or are we just gonna keep leaning towards the kind of observations that match our perception of the universe as humans? No, I, 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 I think we're, uh, I don't know about the future, obviously, but my impression is that everybody who talks about the, the grand unified theory being behind the corner is just completely out of, of touch with reality. I mean, I, I think we're still, you know, Newton. Newton's the guy who got the biggest jump, and he described himself famously as, a, you know, a kid uh, who has discovered a few things in front of the ocean of the unknown. I think we're still there. I think that's an excellent place to end. Thank you very much indeed for coming. Thank you very much. Thank you.